you are kind of the highlight of our summer programs lecture series. And I hope that for the students, it kind of uh, takes out the, um, the pressure. You know, I hear some of you are nervous about your final review tomorrow. I hear some of you are um, want, to, want to make sure that all the prints get out right and so on. So let me tell you something, it's all gonna work out. You just have to calm down. It's all gonna be fine. And you're gonna have a really great, amazing review tomorrow. So um, I'm holding the thumbs that everything will work out. And I hope that this lecture kind of takes your thoughts a little bit towards a slightly different angle of architecture, which we haven't seen so far in the summer lecture series. So I'm excited to welcome uh, Dana and Cristobal today. Dr. Danica uh, engages uh, spatial justice and cultural studies of architecture as a teacher, scholar, practitioner, and activist. Her leadership in urban innovation is widely recognized both in the US and abroad. In 2006, Cuff founded City Lab, a research and design center that initiates experimental projects to explore metropolitan possibilities. In 2019, City Lab expanded its social and political engagement by creating CoLab in the Westlake slash MacArthur Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. In long-term partnership with community organizations, City Lab was featured on CNN and in Newsweek magazine and was named one of the top four urban think tanks in the country by Architect Magazine. The lab's Housing First research demonstrates that affordable, well-designed housing and neighborhoods are attainable foundations of equitable cities. City Lab has developed sustainable, high-performance, low-cost housing prototypes for infill sites ranging from backyards to schoolyards. In 2017, after a decade of research that included a full-scale demonstration house built on the UCLA campus, Cuff co-authored California state le legislation, effectively opening 8.1 million single-family lots for secondary rental units. Since 2013, Cuff has led a cross-disciplinary team at UCLA with a substantial multi-year award from the Mellon Foundation for the Urban Humanities Initiative. Cuff co-authored a book about this effort entitled Urban Humanities, New Practices for Reimagining the City. This is the most recent of numerous books, um, including Architects, People, Architecture, The Story of Practice, The Professional City, and Fast Forward Urbanism. Dana Cuff publishes and lectures extensively about the modern American metropolis architectural agency, affordable housing, and architecture's potential for creating more just cities. Dr. Cuff recently received three prestigious, prestigious awards that describe her career. Woman in, Architect, Woman in Architecture, Arch, Activist of the Year, an International Prize for Researcher of the Year, and Educator of the Year. So thank you so much, Dana, for joining us today. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so what I wanna, organize my short talk today around is the idea that there are different ways of practicing architecture. All of you are thinking in some way about uh, how architecture might affect your future, maybe even being some kind of an architect. And I think we often come to architecture with pretty um, kind of media conventional ideas about what architecture is. I suspect that Yulia's own practice and the other people who've spoken to you during this lecture series have really shown you a much wider range um, of what architecture can be. And I'm going to show you one more. And that's that the practice that comes out of City Lab. Specifically, I'm going to talk today about the way design, research, data driven research, and law intersect particularly around the architecture of affordable housing. So sometimes we think of design as an aesthetic practice, really one that's a formal manipulation, it's sculptural, creates really beautiful objects like the Sydney Opera House. Um, we also know that uh, architecture can be a kind of futurist thinking. Uh, Archigram was one of the most remarkable of these kinds of practices that lay out a kind of science fiction in the form of architecture that show us critical models about what uh, a city might be or architecture might be. And, and then there are kind of instances of data-driven research. And these tend to be empirical studies of existing conditions and making 
form fit the human body or some kind of behavioral conditions. Uh, you know, Jakobsen's studio did these kind of urban ergonomic studies to produce really remarkable chairs that obviously are going far beyond data and turn out to be aesthetic objects also. But a fourth option might be this idea that I wanna put forward to you, which is design as projective research. Let me put my timer on just so that I don't go over. Um, by that, I mean uh, that really we can gather data, but we're not just looking at existing conditions and trying to reproduce them, but to actually look at existing conditions in order to open new possibilities. And here's just one simple example in Los Angeles where many of you are located right now. Um, you see in the map, these black dots all indicate surface area parking lots. There's a lot of them. That's a lot of open land for us as architects to think about building on. And it turns out that land when it's parking lot is already divided up into modules of parking spaces and the alleys by which you get to those parking spaces. So it comes with a kind of formal order. So we looked at those kinds of sites and then we looked at housing models that would fit onto that formal uh, grid in ways that could capitalize on all of that open land and build housing above it. So that's just a simple single slide example of what I'm talking about as projective research. If I had to give projective research a simple definition, this would be it. The use of conventional and innovative research methods for studies that are expected to lead to desired future outcomes. Pretty simple. These are story polls. You've probably seen those around in the landscape that show um, people who are driving by where a structure is going to be in the future. And in a way, it's a kind of projective model saying, are you, is this going to work in this community? Do you have anything you want to say about this? Uh, will this meet your approval? So it's a kind of participatory projection. So the three projects I want to talk with you about today are one that you can, those of you who are on campus can go down and see at the Wooden Recreational Center. It's the Bruin Hub. Um, a second one, these are all what I would call housing models if you take an expansive idea of accommodation. The second one is an ADU model, which is the kind of project you're all dealing with, which we call backyard homes. Um, and the third one is the one that we're kind of in the thick of right now, which is education workforce housing or housing on school land. So let's go back to the Bruin Hub and I'll just show you a brief video about how this was laid uh, up by, set up by data. Something like 43% of students at UCLA commute more than 60 minutes, meaning they don't live on campus and they've got a pretty harrowing drive to and from school every day. Los Angeles isn't an easy place to be a car commuter. And so we set up the Bruin Hub in order to meet these extreme commuters needs so that they could have a place to rest, study, even stay overnight occasionally on campus. This was designed by Marta Novak and some students in one of our graduate programs. The video was made by another faculty member, Nathan Sue. We did a series of ergonomic analyses, uh, prototype testing, and post-implementation studies. <laughs> Thank you. 
So here you see some of the ways we gathered data, not just ergonomic data, but also focus groups of what students who were commuters wanted. We met with them, we um, asked them questions and took down their responses. And this is what resulted, which is really a prototype for more ways in which uh, housing insecure students uh, at UCLA and other campuses might be better accommodated at the university where the dorms don't suit their needs. And in fact, now there are two more Bruin Hubs kind of uh, settings being built on the campus at UCLA now. Um, and here's the way we were studying uh, where it might spread. And you can see that napping space, if you look at that lower left, that's what the University of Michigan provides to students. And it's pretty stigmatized and uninviting. And so this really was a way to say that students who need to have a place to stay overnight on campus deserve uh, the kind of dignity and design pleasures that we might give to other students um, without any stigma attached. And in fact, it's been a little bit difficult to reserve the spaces for the students who need it most because everybody wants to use the wooden hub. Okay, a second project is the one uh, we called Backyard Homes, which really it shows what projective research, the extent of it can be. We took something like 10 years to undertake this work uh, because it was so difficult to understand what the backyards across Los Angeles, let alone across the state, might accommodate. So uh, if you look at this um, map, something like 80% of land in Los Angeles, and that's true across the entire state, is zoned specifically for single family residences. It's the most underutilized land in the entire American landscape. Meaning, again, as architects and as people who are really trying to think about social, social justice and spreading home ownership and the ways we can build wealth through ownership, particularly for people who've been harmed by suburban expansion. And we know now that people of color and particularly black households have been discriminated against in suburban uh, construction and ownership that redensifying the suburbs would be a way to accomplish all kinds of environmental and social goals. So um, City Lab, and students at City Lab undertook a range of studies from finding out what neighborhoods had in mind and what they wanted. Uh, you see a neighborhood meeting on the left. We did field surveys where in some neighborhoods, uh, there were already a lot of ADUs built informally or illegally, um, which would is dis a disadvantage for those homeowners because they can't regain their investment if the um, secondary unit is illegal. And um, also kinds, what kinds of construction would work for building in people's backyards? Sometimes that might mean walking down a five, yard, five foot side yard setback and popping out a kind of recyclable lightweight structure. And that's really what we were working with when we built the um, demonstration, full scale demonstration house that you see on the lower right. Uh, which was led by Kevin Daly Architects, but really built over a one week period by a group of graduate students at UCLA. Maybe more remarkable than the demonstration house is that then uh, those of us at City Lab were able to co-author legislation based on all that research that we took to the state uh, government and passed a law that essentially ended single family zoning in the entire state of California. Uh, it's never quite stated that way, but in fact, that's what happened. Um, and so in 2017, almost every lot for where there was one house could now have two, doubling the density, reducing the carbon footprint and greenhouse gases. And in fact, spurring further legislation 
so that now uh, there's new laws that show that four houses can actually be built on single family lots. All right, and now I'm just gonna take my last few minutes to talk about um, the current work we're doing. Uh, let me just pause for a moment and say that all of this research could only be done in an architecture research lab. And that might come slightly as a surprise, but it's because we're dealing always with uh, particularly form-based problems in the city and in land. They're all infill conditions. We very rarely have the opportunity to build uh, vast greenfield kinds of developments, but instead working in really complex sites in neighborhoods that already have a character and a politics. Um, so basically the way design visioning can contribute both to the investigation of what's possible, but also in the engagement of public participation is essential to making uh, new kinds of cities and their possibilities turn into uh, prototypes that can lead to laws. So what we discovered in the ADU work was that we thought maybe because the houses were going to be small, they would be affordable. But because the housing crisis is so vast, in California, they didn't, uh, they, they're slightly more affordable than other forms of housing, but they weren't nearly as affordable as the state needed because they were in people's private backyards. It was much more difficult to guarantee a low rent for those units. So at City Lab, we started thinking, how could we assure infill housing that could be guaranteed affordable? And as we looked at the landscape, of cities like Los Angeles, but actually all across the state, we realized there were vast areas of unused land related to schools, public schools, the K through 12 schools in particular. It turns out there's 150,000 acres of school land in the state of California, that's a lot. Um, and about half of that is underutilized and in areas that might need affordable housing. So you can see on this map um, where all the school properties are. And one of the beauties of thinking about K through 12 school land is that every community has a small school or medium sized school in its heart so that this housing would really be potentially integrated into neighborhoods of all different sorts. There was already a law on uh, in California that allowed for the construction of housing on school property. And that had been there since 2015, but only four housing developments have been built. Three of those in Los Angeles, which has the largest school district in the entire state. And in fact, has its own real estate division and architects. So they know how to do it. Whereas a small town, uh, Tulare, uh, you know, Stockton, um, Fallbrook, none of those towns would have the capacity to think through how to build housing on their school land. So at City Lab, we spent two years studying both the buildings that had been built um, and looking at all the land across the state to see what kinds of housing could be built and what were the barriers in the current laws that made it so that um, housing was so difficult. We partnered with two uh, research centers at Berkeley to do this and um, found that those four housing developments that had been built were so popular that there were long waiting lists, even though the conventional wisdom was that teachers didn't wanna live on their school sites. It turned out that was absolutely not the case. And so we investigated different ways that uh, architectural housing solutions might fit onto existing school land given existing school buildings, but also uh, empty lots like bus parking lots and other sorts of uh, school owned properties. And we wrote a uh, new legislation uh, under the term AB 2295, which you see here, which is 
taking away the land use barriers, it guarantees a three-story certain density of housing on any school property, which means that school districts and developers, housing developers, both for-profit and not-for-profit, will know that they can get something built despite all of the um, political resistance that not in my backyard kinds of um, neighborhood organizations have put up as a means to uh, work against affordable housing in their neighborhoods. Uh, we also know that we can establish highly affordable um, tenancy and it goes first to teachers. So I'm particularly pleased uh, by September, we'll know if this gets through every committee in the entire state. And by January, we should have this law on the books. Um, oh, and I thought I had a picture of my city lab team, but that got um, it erased somehow. Just imagine this filled with students like yourselves, uh, because those are really uh, the people that power all the research and design that we do at City Lab. So I'll stop sharing now and thank you. Thank you, Dana, for that lecture. Um, and now we will be hearing from Cristobal Amunategui. I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly. So Cristobal is an assistant professor of architectural history at UCLA and partner in the Santiago-based office, Amanetsugui Valdez. He received his BA in architecture from Universidad Católica de Chile, an MS from Columbia University, and a PhD from Princeton University. His recent research in investigates architecture's intersection with art, trait, and technology in the 19th century France, focusing on emerging modalities of patronage and representing during France's transition from the Second Empire to the Third Republic. Other research and teaching interests include the early modern history of techniques, modernism and its 20th century corollaries in architecture, and the history of 19th and 18th century historiographies across disciplines. He's currently working on a book manuscript of, on the relationship between building, crowds, and speculation in the 1860s through, 80, through 1880s in France. Cristobal's essays and book reviews have appeared in AA Files, Factor, and Critical in Inquiry, among others. He has pre previously taught at Columbia University and Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. In 2011, Cristobal co-founded the office Amunategui Valdez, which comp comprises the architectural work he and Alejandro Valdez have developed since 2004. Thank you so much, Cristobal, for joining us today. Thank you, Stein. Thank you so much for the intro. Uh, thank you, Julia, for inviting. Um, it's a pleasure to talk um, to you guys and alongside my dear colleague, Dana. Uh, so I'll just share my screen right away. What I'll do, given that, um, let me see. Do you guys see the full screen? Yes, but we see your notes also. All right, so we'll do just this. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so what I thought I would do, to, I, I knew that Dana would somehow touch on, on ADUs and housing uh, more broadly. So I thought that I would bring in with me a case of uh, basically, you know, but uh, one of the offshoots in a way of, of Dana's work that has come by way of um, the LA Department of uh, Safety, of Buildings and Safety um, Program for the deployment of um, ADU prototypes. So I'll be showing that very briefly. And by way of doing that, I'll show you guys a little bit of the work we do also in our office. But uh, in the second part of the brief talk, I'll try and show you guys a little bit of uh, the work I've been doing uh, for my book project, which comes out of my dissertation that I defended a year and a half ago or so, and which informs part of the stuff I teach at UCLA as well. So let's see, a um, couple of years ago, the, the, the Los Angeles Department of Buildings and Safety um, invited a number of uh, firms, relatively young firms, uh, 
in Los Angeles to develop designs for the standard plan program, which is, as I anticipated before, is a program that comes out of the legislation efforts, basically, that Dana has been spearheading, uh, leading um, in connection with the ADUs, right? So the function of this program is twofold. It's on the one hand um, to actually uh, palliate to some extent the housing shortage in the city of LA, an effort that has met a few difficulties as Dana was uh, explaining due to uh, cost rises and so forth due to COVID and, and other reasons as well, but also to connect those efforts with um, the architectural profession at large. There is any number of really very young and talented architects around in the city. And so this plan, in some sense, uh, tries and, and, and connect those, those needs with um, young professionals that are looking for essentially opportunities to, to practice and to show their designs. And so this is um, part more broadly of an effort uh, from the city of LA to actually introduce a little bit of architecture culture as Los Angeles used to have throughout the 20th century, historically and famously, uh, the administration wants to once again connect the notion of public works with uh, high quality, high standard quality design coming out of, of uh, professionals in Los Angeles. So as you see, this is one of many recent efforts uh, in that direction. Um, some of them have come by way of competitions, some others by uh, competitions that are, you know, essentially built around ideas that may fuel and, and nurture further efforts in the realm of housing. Ours, um, the ADU plan was meant to be offered as a catalog of possibilities for clients to go into the, 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 the City of LA's website and pick their own their design of choice among any number of designs produced by this uh, list of 12 or so offices. It's just the pilot. So basically any architect can join in and offer their design to be showcased in the, in the website. Um, this is you know, part of what Dana showed already. It's a, quite a practical and, 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 and uh, lovely kind of uh, catalog um, on how to use uh, ADUs, all the possibilities uh, of, of, of ADUs. And so if you consider this site as a kind of average standard site in the city of LA, what we thought would be uh, appropriate in some sense was to design for the city a kind of uh, pil pilot design that could be as neutral as possible. We didn't know for sure what kinds, what kinds of uh, circumstances the potential clients would meet when they were looking for their, their designs, how specific their, their site conditions were. So what, what we aim to do was essentially create as neutral a, a, a plan basically for them to uh, use in whichever way they wanted. Um, and so part of uh, that idea uh, yielded this, this, um, this square plan that has uh, two bedrooms. One of them can be the, the, you know, the, the, the usual, uh, the main bedroom, basically. There's a bathroom right here. And then this second bedroom could be either for children or as, you know, to be used as a studio or, you know, to be rented out for further sort of uh, tenants and whatnot. And here you have a, the other half of the house um, offers a chance to have just a very conventional living room with a kitchen and, and dining room all together. Um, this house can be, of course, placed just about anywhere, so long as you uh, can also rotate the, the, the plan, as it were. So because of uh, sun exposure conditions, lighting conditions, or even even because of the position of the of the pre-existing house in on the site, you could actually face this house in whichever way you want. One thing we added, which is this staircase that you see here, the spiral sta staircase, which is the one thing that extends out of the perimeter of the house and co co communicates basically the, the backyard with the rooftop that we decided to install right here 
as a way of adding more um, backyard surface, uh, so to speak, so that the backyard wouldn't be uh, in dispute between the two occupants, the two houses. Whether they wanted to share the backyard or, or not, that we don't know. So essentially we are adding backyard surface by way of this rooftop so that the possibilities of backyard space are multiplied rather than reduced. Other than that, we also added a kind of perimeter gallery here uh, to use as a bench of sorts, as some kind of furniture uh, piece here that can be used um, a little bit in this, in this way. Uh, so the house is extremely simple in terms of the construction techniques employed in it. It's just wood frame. It's just about the, the so whether you want to buy at Home Depot some kind of, uh, you know, awning of this kind or just like install your own, you know, awning, uh, it, it doesn't matter. But uh, you see here the house is, is, is showing every facade is, is you know, composed in the same fashion. So basically, this is what I was saying when I was mentioning the fact that the fact that the house was quite neutral in terms of the layout. Um, so uh, now let me let me just um, to that to that architectural work, let me just um, tell you about the work I'm doing as a historian, basically, as an architectural historian uh, at UCLA. Um, what I've been working on for the past uh, year or so is um, um, I've been translating the, the doctoral work that I did for Princeton into a book project. That book project is really about a, a, a certain change in the conditions under which buildings were not only produced in the late 19th century in France and more broadly gradually in Europe, but also about, about the conditions under which, under which people commission buildings. In other words, what I pay attention to is um, a change in the, in the modes and, and in the structures of patronage, uh, of architectural patronage for that matter. Patronage we call basically um, the, the structure of clients basically in place that have the ability to commission buildings in, at any given time, right? That's, that's what, you know, what one may very simply call patronage, architectural patronage. And so what, I'm, what I've been focusing on is a change in, in that mode, in that system that allowed previously a very close, neat bourgeois circle of, of, of commissioners, of clients, of patrons to commission buildings that were equally, equally tied to that kind of culture, right? Uh, as embodied in the Academy of Bossart. You may have heard that in, in the 19th century uh, sort of educational system in Europe and in many other places in the West, the model of pedagogy was that articulated by the uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is the, the, the Academy of Fine Arts in France, right? They exported um, and sometimes imposed um, ways of teaching architecture that were very much built around uh, Classical, the classical styles, right? And so um, around 1870, due to both economic reasons, but also political reasons, um, there is a gradual change and expansion, in fact, in terms of who uh, can uh, both commission and invest in architectural objects, basically, in buildings. Let me show you uh, a little bit of that um, uh, in the next few slides. This happens, so essentially what I pay attention to is what, what are the, the, the design procedures, the laws, the, um, the commercial techniques, the media instruments that go into conforming a kind of a, a class that sees itself as, as a class that becomes the patron of architectural work, right? And how that changes around that time to expand the constituencies that can both commission and invest in architecture, right? So I follow one particular case, which is this hippodrome right here. A hippodrome that is located in, in, in the city of Paris in the west side of Paris. That is not commissioned really by neither one of the two main uh, sort of uh, 
patron groups at the time, either the empire, the government basically, or these close-knit bourgeois circles that I've been mentioning. But a, a sort of third, third body of investors, which is, um, to call it very, very simply, um, the crowds. Crowds could go after 1867, it's a very key year because the law expanded the accessibility to this uh, kind of investment. Uh, we may talk about how and, and in, in which you know fashion that happened. But now people, just about anyone really, with a salary, could go to a stock exchange and buy shares of a building and therefore be co-owner of that building, as it were. But you know, anyone could own shares of these buildings. A mechanism that allowed. Uh, the group of investors that, that launched projects like this to gather money and invest that money in the materialization of that building. So sometimes you would announce, you know, in the media, in the newspapers, uh, that there were shares on offer at the stock exchange for, you know, a building such as this one, the Hippodrome, the Lalma. Um, and so, and so, even before the building was 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 materialized, was was built. And so, basically, the way these guys had to gather money uh, was was to um, commercialize it by way of the stock exchange through the sale of uh, of shares of actions, as the as the uh, French called them. So, in this particular case, over the first six months, there were more than 6,000 shares sold, which is how the, the corporation behind, behind this building could actually gather the money and, and invest uh, in the, in the formally say, in the construction of this building. Why this building is important, I think, is because it signals both a new way of uh, incorporating constituencies and, 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 and engaging constituencies in the production of architecture. Um, but also it created new audiences, it created new publics. You have to understand that but by uh, 1867, the only main building that was under construction at the time in Paris was the, the big opera house commissioned by the emperor, uh, Napoleon III, a, a, a highly exclusive, sort of uh, opera uh, building that was meant to, in some sense, show spectacles that were tied to the classical tradition and that expectedly gathered a very sort of uh, reduced segment of the population. What happens with a building like this is that either by way of you investing in shares of the building or by you simply paying for a ticket and accessing the spectacles that took place inside this building, this building tripled the capacity of, of, of audiences basically relative to the opera. So this is a huge, huge interior that in some sense, as the picture shows, was masked with some neoclassical sort of facade, but effectively uh, roofed basically with a roof structure that resembled more some sort of railway railway construction um, as it was in fact materialized by a railway company that uh, uh, finished the building. In any case, this is basically how you would have learned in, in the 1870s that this building was on offer at the stock exchange. You could buy one share here by 700 francs. As I said before, you know, if you compare salaries at the time with a company, you know, anyone who received a relatively average average salary could have owned shares of this building. So it's a rare case of capitalism overlapping in some sense with um, with early socialist forms of mutual and associative. Uh, cooperations. Uh, this is one of the arguments I try to make. Uh, that the kind of corporation that allowed for this marriage of crowds, investing crowds, and uh, architecture was a rare um, kind of uh, again overlap between uh, liberal uh, sort of um, political eco uh, econo uh, economy and uh, the the kind of mutualism. An associationism that 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 came about uh, uh, after the revolution in France and, and essentially throughout the the nineteenth century, um, and that actually coalesced in forms of government um, 
and in, our, in, in, in aesthetic forms as represented by certain buildings at the time uh, in the 1870s as after a very sort of bloody and deadly civil war that the French had in 1870. So um, what I do in this project is I follow this group of people that uh, not only materialize the Hippodrome through the Societe Anonyme, the kind of corporation I've been talking about that offer shares at the stock exchange and so on, but also public pools that were however private in, in terms of the entrepreneurial models uh, pursued by this group, they were offered to local munici municipalities for students from all kinds of public schools that were actually being invented at the time, the, the, the universal public system of education in France, to come and learn how to swim. So what I'm what I mean to say here is that there was a, a quite a bit of negotiation between be, between these private corporations and the local authorities, so that any one of these buildings built through these kind of corporations had the mandate to satisfy what the um, French called a raison social, a social reason for it to exist. It had to serve the public in some fashion. That's essentially um, the point. And so you see what I'm showing are only cases of buildings built by this particular group of people. And they all have to do with uh, not just leisure, but also forms of uh, association of um, social life. These are the buildings that effectively articulated the social life of the period. And they did it in some sense by uh, way of this marriage between capitalism and socially, socialism, if you will. Um, now, the abstraction of all of these procedures, imagine you go to a stock exchange to buy shares of a building that doesn't yet exist, right? The abstraction of these mechanisms was in some sense compensated by highly specific, regulated, precise modes of marriage between the latest available technologies at the time, as you see here, and rather conventional contain architectural containers. So this is another one of the points I make in this in this in this project is that however abstract the means to raise the funds and gather the investors that were in essence anonymous investors, um, these buildings showcase highly precise modes of um, of um, yes of um, of architectural materialization, right? And so I think this is, is this, no. So you see here, and with this, I, I, I wrap up uh, the, the talk. You see here uh, the, the combination between rather conventional interiors used in the 19th century, the, 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 one of the main tropes of public life was the great interior that could actually house public life with all of these um, highly precise forms of, uh, uh, technological artifacts that, in a way, in the case of the Hippodrome, topped the, the the building and 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 turned it into an interior that could be at the same time an open air uh, uh, interior as well. And so, you know, in the press of the time, this is showcased everywhere. The these attracted scientists, such as the one on the right hand, hand side, which was a, a chrono photographer, a medical researcher that were for the most famous hospital in Paris at the time, taking pictures of patients. He turned the Hippodrome into a, an actual laboratory for the study of, um, of, um, of, of the dialogues in some sense between technology, uh, animal life, uh, audiences and so forth. These interiors actually also served to vi render visible certain problems of the period, of the of, of, of societal problems of the period. Um, the 1880s is the time when the uh, femme nouvelle, the new woman emerges. Woman essentially emerges as a protagonist of the period. Now women earn salary, they are employed in business and so forth. And so certain shows displayed inside this building um, render visible those those sometimes controversies those opportunities those you know those political tropes um on the left hand side and with this i finish um you see how the press all the organs of the press gathered inside this building and essentially put pressure on the government to raise the ban on the press the the, the a law that censored the press uh, effectively uh reaching a 
kind of solution with the government uh, freeing the press a year later. So, and then th this is what I'm talking about when I talk about, uh, the, you know, anonymous investors that came to this building either simply through the purchase of a cheap ticket or owning shares of the building, contributing to the materialization of these buildings. Um, I leave it there. Uh, Thank you both so much for giving like an insight into your work. It was especially interesting to see what you are most recently working on in, in both of your cases, Dana. I, I didn't know about uh, a lot of the things what you have accomplished in terms of the laws which you brought through. And so that was super interesting for me. And, and also with you, Christabel, it was really exciting to see the book you're working on and thank you so much for, for sharing an insight into that. Really enjoyed it. Um, I also saw that there's many people in the audience uh, who are not necessarily related to the summer programs. And I, I really excited that uh, the AUD community is coming together here uh, to, to join us uh, for this last lecture. I know that the teenagers have always a lot of questions and also the college students from Jumpstart. So, uh, especially because they're working on an ADU. So I want to open up the floor. Um, if you're remote, please submit your question through the chat um, or the Q&A. And if you're in person, please come up to the mic. Uh, don't be shy. Um, please ask some questions. Um, hello, I don't know if you can hear me. but um, So I just have two questions, just one for both of you. Um, just first of all, for Dana, I just want to say like I'm a huge fan of City Lab. And like obviously a huge part of Dunn's vacation in California, especially like living in the suburbs and just living the kind of low dense life, it's just a little awful. But um, my question was, is regarding ADUs, how does that affect the car density, like the car dependency of LA and kind of this reliance on vehicles? Do ADUs kind of lead to like um, an overcrowding of like the car infrastructure or do they lead to a decline in car ownership? That's a great question. Uh, you know, the first accusation about ADUs was that it was going to make parking impossible in neighborhoods. And one of the things we discovered was that nobody parks in their garage anyway. It's all filled with the stuff they need for storage. So everybody's already parked on the street and adding another car didn't really matter. Um, so the impact on parking has been small, at, at least according to early research. But what was more interesting is that we tied the legislation to public transit. So if you're within 500 feet of a bus stop, uh, you can do you can use the ADU law and something like 85% of Los Angeles, despite the fact that we think of it as a place where there is no public transit, 85% of housing is within 500 feet of a bus stop. So really it kind of goes along with the reduced emphasis on cars that I think we're seeing all over the city. And the more we densify suburban land, the more public transit makes sense. <laughs> so it's actually kind of had the opposite effect that the people who were against densifying the suburbs originally had. Um, which was not a shortage of parking, but an increased use of public transit. Thank you, yeah. And then um, for Cristobal, I was just wondering, um, from like a historical perspective, you were talking about how like all these buildings in Paris were kind of built for like a social purpose and for community. Was that continued after like the second uh, empire and like the Paris Commune or did that kind of construction decline after that? Well, that's a great question. All of these cases I showed are right after the Paris Commune. So in some sense, the Second Empire was in such a state of decline that had to adequate basically the, the law for these little corporations to be uh, accessible, not only to monopolies, right? But to just about anyone who wanted to start a corporation and fund their buildings. So long as they could justify those buildings in terms of their, the social good they would do to communities, right? So that, 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 that sort of liberalization of the franchise uh, elicited a kind of, uh, you know, an interesting, uh, yeah, an interesting collection of uh, associates anonymous that could actually both satisfy housing 
needs. Uh, for instance, the very famous Hill of Montmartre in Paris is covered with housing units that by the standards of the late 19th century were quite cheap. So many workers joined those areas uh, and it was in fact a cooperation between one of these corporations and the local authorities that in some sense subsidized land so that investors could join in and buy um, and sort of fund the construction of these housing units. Um, and so, yeah, the question is good because during that window of time that may have lasted some 20 years, all of this happened, but then uh, deregulation began to kick in. And so the, the tightly sort of regulated uh, corporations as I presented them began to be deregulated to the point that the so-called social good that these buildings were meant to, uh, you know, sort of inject into the city was no longer required by law, right? And so gradually these corporations became the kind of instruments that would lead to the crash of 29, of 1929, to the, the, the the stock ex exchange crash of 29. So in some senses, is is a lesson of, of corporations being, so long as they are regulated, they, they did work quite quite in, interestingly in, the, in, in that period, but later they don't have a very successful kind of uh, ending, yeah. All right, yeah, thank you so much. It was so great hearing from both of you. Cool. Michael Austin said, any chance I can buy shares in someone else's ADU? No, but I was thinking, Cristobal, we should turn that into a new housing subsidy program today. What what profits did people get or what earnings did they get from the shares that they bought? Um, that's a good question. What was it? I remember reading this is, you know, this is this is part of the sort of uh, nitty gritty data that I've been kind of gathering, but I think um for you by the end of the year there were revenues that were counted in the amount of 20 percent in this in the first year which is is, is quite is, is huge by the fourth fifth year it went down quite a bit because the novelty at least i'm talking about the hippodrome in particular the novelty of of of, of essentially the, the the practice of buying shares for that building kind of weighing down. And then it, it, it recovered again toward the end, but at its best, I think it was something around 20%, which is quite interesting, yeah. All right, thank you. And then um, um, any more questions from the audience? I guess I had another question as well, um, personally for Dana. Um, I was wondering how you talked about uh, schools and giving up their land use for these ADUs. I was just wondering how uh, willingly, I guess, are they to give up their land use and who do you reach out to and who makes that decision? Is it, I guess, the state or the school board or um, does that maybe differ between private and public schools? Yeah, no, it's only public schools that this applies to. Um, and it has to be initiated by the schools themselves something I failed to mention is that the schools that are most interested in trying to use some of their land in this way are the schools that are having the hardest time uh, recruiting and retaining their teachers. So 25% of starting teachers can't afford to live in their districts, which is really horrible. You know, we've had this workforce mismatch, like uh, police uh, force, firefighters, teachers can't live where they have their jobs. So there are teachers that are teachers' aides in particular are sleeping overnight in their cars so that they can get to school in the morning. I mean, that's just obscene. So it's those districts and the school boards and their superintendents administration that started, um, but it really relies heavily on nonprofit housing organizations stepping in to help them because of course school boards are made up of mothers and dads basically who probably know almost nothing about housing development. So though they see their teachers are needing it, they um, don't know what to do next. All right, well, if there's no more questions, um, I would like to thank both Dana and Cristobal for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Good luck on your yes. projects.
Thank, Thank you, you Dana, Cristobal. Thank you, Stein, for running all the lecture series so greatly um, and being so reliable at all times and giving all our panelists so great um, introductions and running the Q&A so great. And thanks, Cristobal and Dana, for your time in your busy, hopefully not so busy summer schedule. Um, and yeah, I want to wish also the students best of luck for the rest of the day in getting their drawings ready and um, I hope uh, besides the stress you also enjoy kind of um, the time uh, the last uh, two days and tomorrow seeing all the amazing work you have produced um, so yeah uh, thanks so much and looking forward to see you around Dana tomorrow then.